All right. So just everybody knows we are recording, but uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Reeder. I am uh, a member of Rise Prince George's, which is a group of county residents and allies advocating for policies and practices that build shared, sustainable prosperity in Prince George's County by creating safe, walkable, and inclusive transit-oriented uh, communities. Tonight's discussion will be on the Walkable Streets Act. Uh, this bill addresses uh, Rise Prince George's priorities, including uh, great places around transit stations and also safe streets for walking and biking. Um, tonight, we'll hear from a number of uh, uh, great people, um, including Council Member Olson and uh, other community members about the importance of safer walkable streets in our county. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge tonight's event is uh, co-sponsored by uh, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association. Um, I do wanna invite uh, uh, Ms. Callie uh, Krampos to share a little bit more about WABA's work in Prince George's County. Callie, I'll send it your way. Go oh, Waba. <laughs> she, uh, not mute. Is she muted? Hold on here. Um, Ali. He asked to have her video enabled. Right. Okay. All right. Hey, everybody. Looks like my yeah. video. There, there you go. go. All right. Hey, everybody. We are so excited to be here. Um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm Kelly Krumpos, and I'm here on behalf of the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, or WABA. Uh, we are so pleased to partner with Rise Prince George's, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, Councilmember Eric Olson, and local advocates for tonight's event. Uh, so I want to take a quick moment to talk a little bit more about WABA's work, um, especially our work in Prince George's County. Um, WABA is a... My dogs have something to say about that. Um, my WABA is a membership organization um, with members across Northern Virginia, DC, and Montgomery and Prince George's County in Maryland. Uh, we work to empower people to ride bikes, build connections and transform places. Um, WABA hosts classes for kids and adults, arranges rides and calls on elected officials and decision makers to improve transportation safety and equity. In Prince George's County, WABA is continuing to call for safer streets, protected places to ride, such as bike lanes and multi-use trails, and improved options for getting around. Um, WABA has a new Prince George's County youth organizer uh, starting in a couple of weeks who will be organizing a youth leadership program around traffic safety, and will be hosting bicycle and pedestrian safety advocacy programs in a number of Prince George's locations in the coming months in cooperation with uh, the Coalition for Smart Growth and Rise Prince George's, along with some other organizations. Uh, we're also excited to be kicking off a series of classes, so we encourage you to check those out. They'll be taking place in locations across the county, um, and those signups are live now, along with lots of other ways to get involved um, in WABA's work across the county. Um, so why are we here tonight? Um, it's because we know we have to make our streets safer for everybody, um, especially folks in Prince George's County. Um, you all know that the county currently has the highest numbers of crashes and fatalities compared to counties across the region. Um, even compared to counties with similar population sizes, Prince George's County is um, nearly double the rate um, over a five-year period. Um, and we know that what's contributing to that high number of crashes and fatalities is in part road design. Um, so Things like um, the legislation that we're here tonight to discuss um, are crucial to making those improvements. Um, the Walkable Ur Urban Streets Act and resolutions are part of the broad efforts that we need to help the county achieve its goals for improving safety, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, meeting health goals, and meeting the needs of county residents. Um, so I'm really excited to be hearing more um, from folks who know this legislation really well. Um, especially council member Eric Olson, um, as well as many folks who are, you know, living this on a daily basis and what we can do to make the county a safer place. So I'll turn it back to Kyle to keep us going. Thanks everybody. Thanks Kelly so much. And uh, I can just say uh, from personal experience, Waba and Kelly are doing an amazing job in the county. It's, it's been exciting to see the, the growth of, of, of bicyclists and, and cyclists 
cyclists across the county, um, especially over the last couple of years. And um, I'm appreciative to be doing this work with them. Uh, it's really important. And uh, thanks, Callie, for that. Uh, so next, uh, I did want to, um, uh, you'll hear from uh, District 3 Council Member Eric Olson. Uh, uh, Council Member Olson has introduced the Walkable Streets Act uh, legislation. And uh, Council Member Olson represents the cities of College Park, New Carrollton, and other communities in that area, uh, including uh, a lot of uh, metro air stations and particularly the Purple Line stations. Uh, Council Member Olson, did you want to uh, give us a little bit more overview of just your work and uh, the work around the bill? Thank you so much, Kyle, for, for, for the introduction. And thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Um, and I, I want to thank, you know, Coalition for Smarter Growth for and, and WABA and, and Rise Prince George's for sponsoring this. this. These are the kind of things that we really need uh, more of in order to, you know, um, highlight the, the problems and the things that need fixing. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate your advocacy. Um, that's what it takes to get good legislation done and policy changes made. Um, so it's really great to see, you know, so many activists um, here on this on this call. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, so I represent District 3. That includes, yes, College Park, New Carrollton, um, Riverdale, the Riverdale area, Riverdale Park, um, Lanham, Seabrook, and, and other areas, Landover Hills. Um, and it is, you know, where the Purple Line um, goes through, uh, the, the bulk of the Purple Line goes through District 3 uh, in, in Prince George's, and, and some of it goes through District 2 as well. Um, and we are, you know, one of the more urbanizing areas of the county. Um, as everybody knows, you know, we have urban areas, um, urbanizing areas, uh, suburban areas, and rural areas. And, and so this legislation, the Walkable Urban Streets Act, um, really, you know, it's focused on the transit stations and the um, activity centers, so the more urban areas. Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that we can't do more in other areas, but this is really to focus on, on um, you know, the most uh, urban, uh, transit-oriented, more walkable areas uh, so that they are, you know, safe for pedestrians and so that they are, you know, the places where people want to come and congregate and, and be true um, in the sort of whole placemaking world, you know, be, be the places um, where, where people want to, want to come um, and feel safe and are safe, not just feel safe, but are safe. But people aren't going to come if it doesn't feel safe. Um, so in my, in, in the past, so I was on the county council previously for eight years um, from 2006 to 2014. And uh, one of the things that we did during that time that I sponsored was the um, Complete and Green Streets legislation. Um, and I see this all as a continuation of that same theme. Um, in 2017, there was the um, Urban Streets Design Standards that the council and the um, you know, DPWT and, and DPI uh, worked on um, to update and um, you know, upgrade the, the standards um, for urban uh, streets. And those were good standards. Um, however, they never got, um, well, standardized. <laughs> they never got put you know, formally into the, um, the, the streets um, standards. So what we're doing now is we're taking those standards and all the work that was done in that, and we are we are updating those, you know, in in other ways as well to meet the most um, the best national um, um, standards for walkable streets. Um, but and then we're going to make the put those into I mean I'll say codify, although it's not necessarily you know codify means in the code, but it um, it's, it creates those standards that they will have to follow. Um, so, you know, why are we doing this? I mean, Prince George's County has in the past, you know, has been behind um, a lot of uh, jurisdictions um, in our in our region. And we need to um, make sure that we learn from the mistakes of, of our past in Prince George's County and, you know, mistakes of other jurisdictions. Um, as we urbanize, uh, we need to make sure that our roads are safe for all users. 
um, and particularly for you know pedestrians and cyclists. Um, no longer should we have the wide you know streets with wide you know with you know that encourage speeding, um, particularly where where we want a lot of pedestrians to be. Um, this legislation prohibits slip lanes, you know, the dreaded slip lanes, which encourage cars to not slow down. Um, and and we, we don't want these arterials that that um, the county has, you know, that go through urban areas to just, you know, encourage cars to zip through. That is antithetical to, to any sense of place. Um, this is also an economic development tool, frankly. Um, so it's to keep people safe, but it's also about we're putting in, you know, we have billions of dollars worth of investment in our transit, in our WMATA, in the purple line that's coming, in redevelopment that's that's happening um, and that has happened. And we need to make sure that we are drawing people in, that people aren't turned you know, away because of that feeling unsafe. Um, you know, these standards create buffers between the curb and pedestrians, uh, it, they will encourage, you know, street trees and um, shade. Uh, they encourage off-street um, uh, bike facilities um, and a 25 mile per hour design speed maximum, um, which was not the case before. Um, frankly, we didn't even have anything below 30 miles per hour uh, previously. Um, it encourages bulb outs, it encourages on-street parking, um, and encourages 10-foot lanes uh, rather than the larger, uh, wider lanes that encourage speeding, um, except for where there's buses, and that's 11 feet. Um, but this is also, you know, obviously this is also about you know, climate change and how we develop um, and how we meet the challenges of climate change and encouraging smart growth um, you know, in Prince George's County, which has traditionally been a very suburban model. Um, um, and I also know there are some tweaks that I expect uh, us to make to the legislation, uh, even, you know, as we go forward to the Transportation Infrastructure, Energy and Environment Committee. Um, you know, it's been pointed out to me about there's a, there's a, um, uh, a little bit of language that did not get changed from the, the, the current law um, that may allow more exceptions than we would want. Obviously, this this is meant to uh, really prevent there from being a lot of exemptions uh, to the standards. Um, so we, you know, I do expect an amendment sheet that would address that. Um, several people have talked to me about that, and you know, that was just you know as we were, had it drafted by attorneys um, that that was left in. So uh, we'll be working on that. Um, but we need to retrofit, you know, we need to retrofit our, our, our most urban areas um, and, and, and we need to do it in the best way possible using national standards, using the best, um, the best standards possible. And we need to get it right. So I'm so glad, you know, to have all of you as advocates, um, you know, and, and um, uh, you know, weighing in on the bill and helping draft it. And, um, you know, uh, I know you'll be there when it comes to the TIEE committee, and I know you'll be there uh, when it goes to the full council, uh, and I appreciate that. And, you know, we, we do need to continue to move forward together um, uh, so that our whole county benefits. And I'm happy to answer questions after. I know we have a panel discussion, so, um, so thank you. No, uh, thank you, council member, for your, uh... But like I said, your, your work um, in kind of leading this, this charge on, for uh, the county, um, as, as you mentioned, so uh, regionally the, the county is, is playing catch up and, and, and this bill allows us to, um, be, uh, to create the infrastructure to make us more competitive uh, uh, with, our, uh, with our rest of the, uh, the jurisdictions in terms of building a safe environment for all uh, road users. Um, so, uh, I think we're going to hold questions and answers to the end, but uh, we, I did want to usher in and invite uh, Cheryl Court, uh, who is a member of Coalition for Smarter Growth, and who will be moderating uh, our panel discussion this evening. Cheryl, did you want to come off mute and, and say hello to everyone? Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kyle. Um, thank you, Councilmember Olson, for all your good work. Um, we really appreciate you spearheading this. And um, before we sort of just uh, wanted to ask, we've asked some people who are members of the community who've been sort of deeply involved or, or generally involved with this kind of um, stuff to um, to just give us some of their perspective. Um, but I wanted to uh, do a quick poll, if we could put up the poll of just to find out where folks are coming from. If you can answer this poll to tell us, um, are you all just big followers of Council Member Olson or are you coming to us from District 6? Mr. Jones. Um, and uh, so we'll just do a couple of seconds to see where folks are coming from. District two is in the lead, interestingly enough. Um, all right. All right, come on seven. Well, Kyle is from seven. So. I am from seven. Seven's in the house. <laughs> but no, it is good. To say, it is okay, good. we got every, uh, we got, do we have one? Yes, okay, all right. We have, we have all, all, all uh, council member districts. Um, accounted for. Are accounted for, great, thank you. So, um, share results. Oh, can folks see these results? I'm not, I just tell you, I'm not a pro at Zoom, Zoom polls, but I like them. I want to be better. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's um, let's move on. We've invited a couple folks to, um, to uh, talk to us about um, their perspective on the bill or what this means. And first is um, we wanted to invite Dan Barrett, Barrett um, who, uh, is, has been active with Rise Prince George's. I know he's also active with WABA as well. Oh, Rachel's from District 7, all right. Um, so Dan's gonna um, share with us a little more detail about the bill and um, has been doing, um, I know he he's moonlighting as sort of this expert in walk bike um, policy issues. He actually has a day job doing something else completely different, uh, but he's gonna share with us um, his, uh, oh, you know, before we do that, I wanted to actually mention, and I wanted to recognize there's a number of elected officials with us and could um, elected officials actually put their names and um, position in the chat. I saw, um, hold on here. I got to get out of full view in order to see. Um, so I saw uh, Danny Schnabel, Schnabel and um, Sam Dem Dennis from uh, city of Hyattsville. Um, and, uh, and it could, and, um, and obviously Mayor, um, Emmett Jordan is going to uh, share some words with us in a minute. Um, and uh, a couple other, uh, elected officials, um, had, um, signed up, um, but I don't see them here. Um, Delegate, um, Ashanti Martinez, um, I saw his name earlier, but I don't see him in the group. But anyway, so thank you, um, elected officials for, um, uh, for, uh, uh, joining us as well. So with that, um, Dan, why don't you um, tell us more about some of the details about the bill, the legislation. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. And I assume folks can see the, the presentation. Yes, we can. All right. Great. So um, my name is Dan Barron. I'm a resident of Riverdale Park, and um, I'll just be giving a brief overview and a little context. I think this will touch on a lot of things that Council Member Olson already discussed, as well as a few things that Callie mentioned. Uh, but the Walkable Urban Streets Act is about implementing the county's complete streets policies that were adopted in 2012 and the urban street design standards that were adopted in 2017. And again, that will um, create benefits of slower streets, safer streets, more people-friendly streets, and will also support transit-oriented economic development. And as um, others have mentioned, um, we have a problem on our streets with speed and speed kills. Wide, fast, over-designed arterial roads are the scene of most pedestrian deaths and severe injury crashes. And as is shown as in this image, the risk of death or serious injury to pedestrians and cyclists rises pretty dramatically just above 20 miles per hour. So urban places should have streets designed for motor vehicles to travel at 25 miles per hour or less. And as Callie and others have mentioned, um, that is why um, safer streets are important in Prince George's County. 
We consistently lead Maryland and the Washington DC region in pedestrian and traffic fatalities. Our county is seeing twice the number of pedestrian deaths um, compared to peer jurisdictions in the area. Um, Council member Olson already mentioned, this is kind of a continuation of, of legislation that has come before. In 2012, the Complete Streets legislation was adopted. Um, for those who may not be familiar, Complete Streets are uh, streets that are designed to enable safe use by all road users. So that includes people walking, rolling, biking, riding public transit and driving. Um, following the adoption of the Complete Streets legislation in 2012, uh, DPWT, the Department of Public Works and Transportation, was charged with devising the urban street design standards, which were templates for specific types of streets and urban areas around our regional transit centers and local centers like Metro and Purple Line stations. Um, some of the key elements are on the slide uh, that's on the screen right now. These elements, again, support safer, slower, and more people-friendly streets. And this has been mentioned before, but what's going wrong? Despite having all this good work that came before and having some sound, complete street principles and urban street design standards, our roadway designs are still falling short and achieving slower speed, safer, narrower, multimodal streets and designated centers. Um, why? Transportation officials continue to build for motor vehicle capacity and speed uh, instead of safety and multimodal travel. Uh, this cartoon shows on the left a scene of a mixed-use main street where cars are part of a larger fabric of people walking, shopping, and riding bikes. On the right, the road has been widened and the buildings and people have been removed so that vehicles can flow freely. It also shows where it upswerves. Um, speed and safety are traded off like this every day. The Walkable Urban Streets Act also addresses um, the gap between policy and implementation by codifying and requiring implementation of the urban street design standards. Uh, it also requires uh, reporting and a 10 year plan to bring streets in designated centers into compliance. Uh, the map on the right shows the West Hydesville local center area and green hatching uh, with red lines showing the county roadways. Uh, the county has eight regional transit districts and 26 local centers like this one. The photo on the left shows a slip lane, which allows drivers to make fast turns onto Agar Road near the metro station. It also shows where a driver crashed into a pedestrian sign near a memorial to Helen Jorgensen, who a driver struck and killed in a nearby crosswalk. Agar Road should have been designed for motor vehicles to travel at or below 25 miles per hour near the metro station. Instead, despite recent reconstruction, Agar Road sees operating speeds well above the posted 30 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, the act will also help right size roads to welcome and better support people walking, uh, rolling, biking, and taking public transit. Multi lane roads uh, generate excessive speeds and are dangerous to people walking and biking. Pictured here is the rebuilt Agar Road uh, with four lanes for cars, when two or at most three uh, are justified by traffic volumes. So while the improved uh, sidewalks and added bike lanes pictured here are nicer than the street was before, a two-lane road with a buffered sidewalk, pedestrian safety islands to allow people to safely pause mid-crossing and protected bike lanes would be both easier to cross and much safer for everyone. The act also requires smaller corner turning radii, which forces drivers to turn more slowly and help keep vehicle speeds lower and pedestrian safer in intersections. Smaller corner radii, uh, force drivers to slow down. So think about navigating a car at a 90 degree turn in a residential neighborhood versus using the sweeping exit ramp of a, a limited access highway. The top image shows how a slip lane circled in red allows cars to make a high speed turn. Um, in the bottom image, the slip lanes have been converted to corner bulb outs requiring vehicles to slow uh, down to make those turns. A uh, bus lane cross-section will also be added to the street types, uh, working with national bus practices. Bus lanes are proposed for Silver Hill Road, a major bus route, and adding bus lanes to urban street types prepares the county for future improvements to the bus lines. And then finally, I think uh, Council Member Olson mentioned this, but one change that is needed to improve Council Bill 69 is to amend the county ordinances to further limit the authority for um, exceptions. That have been relied on the past to deviate from these kind of street science standards. 
Um, and there's some more resources here. This presentation will be shared after today's discussion. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, I think, Kyle. Thanks, Dan. This is a, a really good uh, presentation. Um, Cheryl, did you have uh, somebody else on the panel? Did you want to yeah, so um, I want to invite um, uh, Largo resident Halima Ali, an activist with uh, Rise Prince George's, and I think Waba too, um, to kind of share some of her experience as of uh, someone who walks and bikes um, in the Largo area and throughout the entire county. Halima? Yes. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, so my name is Halima Ali, and I live in the Largo Kettering area. I am car free, so I don't own a car. Um, by choice, and I walk, bike, scoot my way to the metro station. I live about 1.5 miles from the metro station. The roads that are closest to me are both 30, one is a 30 mile per hour um, near school zone, and then the other one's a 40 mile per hour. Um, both of them are not conducive to walking or biking. Um, they're not conducive to any type of um, any type of activity outside of a car. Um, it makes it very difficult for me to do day-to-day -day tasks, going grocery shopping, uh, just moving about, even walking my dog, it's just a hassle. And um, there are plans. The reason why I'm an advocate and I advocate for these things is because this does impact me on my day-to-day -day life, but it also impacts so many other, other people as well. Um, so that's, kind of what I wanted to share. Great. Thank you, Helena. Um, and uh, next I want to, is um, Nandegua here? I didn't see him come in. Uh, can you raise your hand if you're here? <laughs> um, but actually, let's, um, uh, um, I want to um, make sure that we hear from um, Mayor um, Emmett Jordan, mayor of Greenbelt, who has been on the scene as a uh, big bike pedestrian walking advocate for for many years. I, I've appreciated seeing you uh, prominent at the, re at the regional level, doing stuff at the Council of Governments, and um, you're always there um, for us to, um, to talk about how we can um, build um, more walkable, bikeable communities. Um, mayor Jordan? Hey, uh, you know, thank you for the invitation to speak. You know, I want to express my gratitude to Councilman uh, Olson for his leadership over the years on behalf of safer streets and, uh, you know, in general and specifically on this uh, CR 69 and the resolution 67 and 68. Uh, I've been on city council in Greenbelt since uh, 2009. I'm an active cyclist. I was actually car free for a number of years and, and ran a successful, a couple of successful political campaigns in Greenbelt without car. <laughs> Which uh, is, uh, which makes me more fit because I do walk and, and bike quite a bit. So uh, Greenbelt's a uh, community literally divided by roads. It wasn't always this way. The original Greenbelt plan uh, back in 1937 was focused on connecting residents to resources and to one another and protecting them from, from cars and trucks. So Greenbelt is considered a regional transit center, according to COG. We've got uh, Metro, we've got WMATA, we've got Mark at our Metro station. But we are literally surrounded by uh, these, these highways, the Beltway, Kenilworth Road, Greenbelt Road. We're divided and surrounded by, by major roads. Uh, one thing I want to quickly mention is we are working together with our sister municipalities, Berlin Heights and College Park, to try and re-envision Greenbelt Road, State Route 193, and uh, over time transform it into a more walkable and bikeable thoroughfare that brings folks to our communities and not just through our, our communities. So we have to work with uh, State Highway to make these things happen. Uh, we were very appreciative and supportive of the complete and Green Street legislation from the county, as well as the uh, urban street design legislation in 2017. But the, the challenge is they, they've never been fully implemented. And a good example that's just outside of uh, Greenbelt is uh, Sunnyside Road between Rhode Island at Route 1, Rhode Island, and Edmonston Road. And although it's just outside of Greenbelt, you know, our residents uh, came together. We have an advisory planning board uh, that's made up of residents. And you know, we made a bunch of suggestions about uh, the construction of a bridge that was uh, rebuilt, retrofitted uh, over that section of Sunnyside. So it, it was constructed, but, you know, the suggestions and, you know, that basic 
basic nod towards complete and Green Street design just didn't get carried out. So the, the bridge, if you've ridden across it or, or tried to, it's, I can't imagine, it doesn't really, it's not conducive for pedestrians or cyclists. And a lot of people ride bikes up in, in the uh, Beltsville Agricultural Center. So it's wide enough to, it's four lanes, is wide enough to uh, accommodate a dedicated protected bike lane as suggested, but instead they, they did not build a continuous lane through on either side. And just for whatever the reason, it just didn't happen at all. So, you know, I'm here to advocate, you know, for this legislation, the county needs to, to actually implement the legislation that's already in place and to go a little bit further and actually retrofit some of these streets so that they really bring people together. And, you know, the county also needs to, you know, provide more leadership and collaborating with the State Highway Administration to make our state highways uh, into better connections. And I know one of the people on the call, I see Jeff Lemieux is on the call, and he's just been passionately trying to move forward with a uh, Greenbelt East connecting trail to kind of connect Greenbelt Road at Roosevelt High School on out the Lanham, Lanham Severn Road. And it's it's another example where, you know, these roads have very wide shoulders. So the, the cost of actually thinking through and implementing these kinds of changes would really, you know, the time to do these things is now, because if we wait and if development continues to, uh, you know, happen in ways that isn't properly planned, you know, it's going to be a lot more expensive to do it later on. So let, let's do these things now. So really, really appreciate uh, Eric Olson, appreciate the uh, the Coalition for Smarter Growth and this uh, legislation, CR 69, and the resolution 67 and 68 are really, really important piece, pieces of legislation. So uh, that's what I got. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, Mayor Jordan. Really appreciate all your uh, leadership over the years on these issues. Um, I don't see Nandigua, so um, I'm going, unless, raise your hand if you're here, Nandigua. I didn't see you. Um, so we'll move to um, Scott Rowe, who is with the um, Park and Planning. Uh, he is the um, with the Planning Department and, and head of transportation. Um, and you could describe exactly what your your role is. Um, but um, we appreciate you um, engaging with us, and and would uh, are very interested to hear your perspective on um, this proposed legislation. Well, great. Thank you, Cheryl. And it's great to be here and to hear so many supportive voices. You know, this is. Uh, uh, legislation that really is, when it comes to Prince George's County and our general plan, Plan 2035, this really is the most important legislation that's come before the council since our the rewrite of our zoning ordinance a few years ago. And it's because this is the legislation that we need to really create the types of places that people want to live, work, and play, learn, uh, and what they want to see when they visit Prince George's County, what they want to see when they're investing in Prince George's County. And so um, it's been very encouraging to see the legislation and to review it. Um, the Park and Planning Commission uh, will uh, review the legislation and provide comments uh, shortly uh, in advance of the committee hearing in September. But, um, you know, it's it's I just want to. And as, by way of introduction, uh, I'm not in charge of transportation for the planning department. I, I think the person who is, is on the call, so I don't want her to get uh, <laughs> upset. I'm just, I, I'm a master planner with the planning department in the community planning division. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why uh, I'm assigned with managing the county's master plan of transportation is that we really need to connect our comprehensive planning and our land use planning with our transportation planning. The best uh, transportation plan is, of course, a good land use plan, and so we want to integrate those as best as possible. Um, I, I'm also thankful to the other speakers who said a lot of the things I wanted to say. Um, I just want to kind of reiterate that this legislation really is the beginning of what's going to be a really uh, challenging but ultimately rewarding effort to remake our county's street network. Um, and it, there, there's several things that we're going to have to tackle in order to be successful on that um, collectively. And that's why it's important not only for uh, public officials and elected officials to, to be on board, but really um, everyone needs to hear from you, the community and, and interested residents who are advocates for uh, the transformation of Prince George's County. 
Um, this really is aligned with where we're going in our master plan. So it's actually out, out in front of it and will give us kind of um, that legislative uh, encouragement to go through the county and really identify where we need to uh, prioritize uh, the reconstruction and redesign of some of our streets to facilitate those types of environments that we all want to see. Um, there are five areas that really are important to focus on uh, as we're uh, getting through this legislation and then moving forward in implementation. Um, one is just a, a general need to change the culture in Prince George's County. Uh, and I don't mean that in a cultural context per se, but um, this is a first tier suburb of a major world city. Um, and it's a very large place. Uh, one of the great things that draws people to Prince George's County is like Councilmember Olson said, we have urban and urbanizing and suburban and rural areas. Um, and and you know, I was telling someone on, on Saturday, uh, the great thing about Prince George's County is there's something for everyone. Um, and But when it comes to our government, uh, when it comes to, uh, and also uh, with state agencies, um, we really need to uh, change the culture towards one that is embracing of things that are urban and walkable. Um, and that's, you know, that's not just streets, it's also public spaces, schools, uh, utilities, um, private development, you know, really have to embrace a culture that knows, that wants to and knows how to do urban things. Um, and that's going to require some capacity building. Um, whether it's the design of new streets or the review or permitting of new streets or when uh, we're constructing new streets, um, Prince George's County is, knows how to do suburban infrastructure, and we really are going to have to invest in capacity building to increase our capacity to do urban infrastructure. We need people who know how to and have experience de developing bike lanes and wide sidewalks and stormwater management and those things. Uh, as, excuse me, those aspects of complete and green streets that we, we want to see. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time and effort in and of itself, just building that capacity so that um, our agencies that are in charge of building and can permitting and constructing uh, urban streets um, have the capacity to do it. Um, our urban street design standards themselves, they're the subject of this legislation. I think if you look at the bills and the resolutions, we have the urban street design standards, which are really an online appendix to a 783 page monster document called the specifications and standards for highways and bridge design. Um, and those two really have to be integrated. You can't have the urban street design standards in one place and then have the rest of the standards for how you build a street, which is what everyone looks at when they want to build a street. Um, you can't have the two things in two different places. It just reinforces that urban is somehow inferior to the suburban design standards. And, uh, you know, that's a bigger lift than can be accomplished through a piece of legislation, but it is something that the Department of Public Works and Transportation needs to look into uh, to really integrate urban design and suburban design so that you're building a truly context sensitive uh, street. Um, and not just a road that has a striped bike lane on it. Um, obviously, the elephant in the room is funding. Um, the amount of money it's going to take to retrofit 333 miles of urban streets uh, to the urban street design standards are going to be is going to be significant. Um, there's certainly prioritization. Some of our new streets will likely be built through the development process. Um, but there are quite a few of county roads and state highways that need to be retrofit um, to urban standards, and that's going to be a, uh, a pretty large expense. Um, and we're really going to have to partner with state government, with the federal government to identify those funding resources to be able to, to uh, execute that. And finally, um, really uh, sticking to it and being consistent and not having this be a one Thing I, I I worked on the working group that developed the urban street design standards back in 2016 2017, um, and there was a lot of momentum then and a lot of, well I, I was excited, um, and there was a lot of thought that okay now we have the standards now it's going to happen uh, we passed the 
new zoning and subdivision regulations in 2018, and those require that pri those require that private streets be built to the urban street design standards in our urban centers and our planned development zones. Uh, but that you know this this bill really closed the loop on that with our public agencies. But we have to be consistent. Um, Operating agencies that are building roads, uh, DPI who permits roads, uh, the planning board who approve roads and streets and subdivisions, um, planning staff, uh, state highway, uh, everyone that plays a role, and private developers, everyone who plays a role in building streets in Prince George's County has to accept that these standards are the, are the law, that you have to build them, and that you know, importantly for our, our colleagues that are professional engineers, it's not the end of the world to build these things. It's actually something that makes travel safer for all users, including drivers. Um, and that's an important context that we have to make sure that the public understands as well. Because when you're making a, you, sometimes you have to make a sacrifice to get what you need. And in this case, uh, we really have to sacrifice uh, vehicle speed uh, to, um to create the safe and inviting environment we want for walkers and bikers and transit users. So with that, Cheryl, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. You know, this is this is really exciting. And of course, we'll have further conversations on the legislation. But, you know, this is this is the beginning of something big. Uh, and I encourage everyone. Um, I'll put some links in the chat. But uh, like I said, we're currently in the middle of doing the countywide master plan of transportation. Um, which will uh, touch on a number of these subjects. Um, and also I'll put a link in the chat to our Neighborhood Planning Academy that we're rolling out in the fall that will um, provide residents of the county with an opportunity to learn more about comprehensive planning, land use, transportation, environmental planning, um, and, and help uh, those who are interested be uh, more empowered uh, participants in the future of the county. So thanks a lot, Cheryl. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, really appreciate um, the work that you're doing. And um, we do really see, you know, the future opportunity. We're, we're interested in the input from, from you and the planning board in, in terms of kind of shaping up this legislation to be all that it can be. And um, and obviously, like the Master Plan of Transportation seems like a, a, an important follow on in terms of getting all of this into that. Um, I, and I just so I want to thank uh, Mary Jordan and Dan and Halima again. And um, before we do Q uh, Q and A, I just uh, I wanted to sort of pop into the chat um, that we uh, we want to make sure that people are following up with. Um, we want to coordinate uh, how we engage um, the other um, council members on this. We've got um, a, a really supportive council, but it's always helpful that they hear from their constituents. And so. Um, so uh, Aisha is going to put into the chat a um, a sign up form. We'll also send it out um, uh, to um, to to identify um, if you can join us for um, reaching out to your council member and making sure that um, that you're they know you're a constituent who supports this and hopes and, and urges uh, your council member to support this too. I would say that. Upon introduction of this legislation, we're in pretty good shape, um, but uh, it's really important that we um, make sure that everybody um, stays uh, supportive and enthusiastic about um, about the legislation. Um, let me see if I can put this into the chat um, for lobbying. I'm going to sort of pop it into the chat. Um, and uh, with that, uh, oh, and then the other thing is that um, Councilmember Olson is the chair of the Transportation Infrastructure, Energy, and Environment Committee, and he'll um, have a he'll he'll do a, um, a a meeting on the bill, or it will be on the agenda sometime in September. And so we'll be reaching out um, to folks again to make sure that you're um, contacting your council members, um, particularly the ones who are on the, on the committee, which is um, council member Ivy, council member Watson, council member Ternoga, council member um, Hawkins. I think that's it. And obviously everybody is represented by council member Hawkins. Um, but uh, so, with that, I wanted to, why don't we just go ahead and um, open up for questions. Um, can folks, um, 
uh, let's actually, Kyle, um, could we look at the chat and make sure we sort of field yes. some of the, the questions we've yeah. had in the chat and then we can go to kind of live Q&A after that. Yeah, the chat has been interesting. Um, I think there is a common theme on some of the questions, but uh, for the panelists, let's talk about the elephant in the room, State Highway. We know Prince George's County has a lot of state roads uh, going through um, our, our huge geographic um, jurisdiction. Um, how did you guys envision this legislation kind of, um, I guess, interacting with the state agency that controls a lot of the roads? Uh, I yeah. guess maybe council member. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, and we could do a whole separate uh, hour and a half on that. We can and will. Time. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, so this legislation is focused on county roads <laughs> because that's what we have jurisdiction over. Um, but uh, yes, we all know, I mean, look, I, I've spent the last you know 25 years working to make Baltimore Avenue and College Park a more walkable, pedestrian-friendly, bike-friendly road, and it's finally under construction uh, now. Um, I know all about you know state highways running through the hearts of uh, communities. <clears throat> um, so yes, a lot of our roads in the county are state roads. Anything with, with three numbers is a state road. Um, and those do run through a lot of our <clears throat> areas. Um, I, so several answers to that. One is, <clears throat> one is, excuse me, I think we need to pass this legislation and show that this is what the county wants. Um, and I, at least in an earlier draft, we actually called upon, I think we said something about, you know, sharing this with the state uh, um, you know, State Highway Administration as well, and encouraging them to do the same. Um, now, that's that's a little weak. I know, I understand. You know, but um, but that is something. I will also say, I I did speak with Secretary Wiedefeld, um, you know, over the summer, you know, a few weeks ago, you know, about this and and everything. And he, you know, I mean, he was very open and very you know open to 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 these kinds of things. But I think that. If we get more energy behind this effort, uh, we should just parlay that that energy and effort into pushing the state and talking with our state legislators uh, as well um, to to do the right thing on 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 local roads. I'll pipe in just a little bit. I, you know, I think it's leadership by example, and to the extent that we you know, have the legislation in place and put these these best practices in place, it sort of becomes more incumbent upon the uh, state highway to actually work with us. Because, you know, so, so often change kind of gravitates, you know, from the grassroots. So with our municipalities, with the county, you know, if we set the standard and stick to it, we can, you know, insist that the uh, state highway, you know, follow our lead. So, you know, my hat's off to, uh, to Eric for uh, his leadership, that's for sure. So we have a couple of questions about the master plan of transportation. Maybe Scott, you could explain how that works and how that would maybe connect to um, this legislation. Uh, sure. So the countywide uh, master plan of transportation is the policy document that articulates Prince George's County's policies and recommendations for the entire transportation network. So everything from what type of street is built where. Um, what type of road is built where, what type of bicycle accommodation uh, goes where, um, it, it, trails that uh, are increasingly part of our commuter network as well as our recreation network. Um, all those recommendations go into the countywide master plan of transportation. Uh, it then gets amended from time to time every time we do a neighborhood or community plan in various parts of the county. Um, but that's an it's an important document not only to help guide our public agencies in, in understanding where we need to invest and in what um, priority, uh, but also um, when for all new development that occurs in the county, they're required to at least improve their frontage to the uh, standards that are identified in the plan. Um, or they, uh, if there's a road, uh, a master planned road that travels through their property, they may need to build that. Um, or if they want to build streets on, in their development, um, it really provides the direction on how and where. Um, and so as a project comes in for uh, 
development approval, it has to conform to that plan. And so it's really important um, document because not only is it a overarching policy plan for the county, it also amends all the transportation recommendations and all 38 of our plans uh, for a 560 square mile county. So uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a pretty large document, but it'll contain a number of maps and a number of recommendations that really help us have the transportation network that we want and deserve to achieve the future that we're trying to um, achieve over the next 25 to 30 years. Uh, yes, it includes public transit. Um, I will throw a shout out that the Department of Public Works and Transportation is working on its transit service operations plan, um, and that might have more near-term recommendations. We're also monitoring uh, the long-term planning that WMATA is working on as far as not only uh, Metro bus, but Metro rail and what the future of that is, along with MTA's work on MARC and really identifying uh, the next, uh, this plan will identify uh, the next one, two, three uh, major transit corridors where fixed guideway transit would be appropriate. Uh, to really start laying that groundwork for where we want to prioritize funding and the planning and design for new transit. Um, as part of the master plan of transportation, you can certainly uh, reach out to the website I posted in the chat. You can uh, reach out to me for more information. Um, we'll be attending uh, several events upcoming uh, uh, by invitation. Um, we well, we're going to we've been invited to to a couple of events. We'll also be at the Prince George's County Fair. Um, and we're happy to come out to any group that wants uh, to meet with us and discuss uh, the transportation network. The schedule I saw, I think it was Janet's question about the time frame. Uh, the plan will be released to the public in next spring. Um, and then it will go through a public review process that includes a public hearing where you can provide input to the planning board and the county council um, and anticipated that it would be approved sometime in 2025. Scott, one of the things that I think this um, this legislation is trying to address is that um, our, it seems like the master plan for transportation is like every road should just be bigger and bigger and bigger. And every, and we have so many sort of like, four, you know, we have so many six lane roads in this county that seem completely out of scale basically for what, you know, for the amount of the volume of traffic or even in front of the new hospital at Largo, it's a four lane road and there's not a lot of traffic on it. And so it's just going to make you as a driver want to drive faster because it, you know, your frame of your, your, uh, you don't see a lot of reason not to basically, it's hard to remember to, to slow down. Um, is there an opportunity to kind of shrink down like what, how we approach um, the future size of, of these roads in the master plan for transportation? Um, yeah, there's that opportunity. I think uh, we're really looking at um, pretty dramatic changes in how we approach street design in our centers um, and in, in our most walkable communities. Um, of course, different contexts for different places in the county. Um, a lot of times, well, every time a new road is built, it's built to what the anticipated traffic would be 30 years from now. Um, and sometimes that pans out and sometimes it doesn't, but it's very, very expensive to put in curbs and gutters and stormwater management systems and um, some of the other uh, infrastructure that we're recommending through this legislation and through um, and, and through the master plan. So it's really important that we identify uh, what are ways to use that right of way in ways that calm and slow down traffic um, while still allowing for if if the worst case scenario happens and there's a, a ridiculous amount of gridlock, you may need to add a lane uh, to alleviate that. Um, and it's a balancing act. And like and and I think that where we're very concerned about uh, pedestrian safety in our centers um, and and the ability to bike, take transit, uh, and get around not only along a street but crossing streets as well. Uh, where the, the lane width is is very important uh, in our suburban and more exurban areas of the county, there may be different considerations uh, that, that come into play. And, and I say that, and it pains me to say that, but uh, also through the master plan of transportation process, we're hearing from a lot of residents 
in the suburban areas of the county who also want better sidewalks, also want safer and more frequent bicycle facilities, which is a great opportunity. Um, and it's going to provide those opportunities to retrofit some of those wider streets that we built for an anticipated traffic volume that inside the Beltway will never come. And outside the body Beltway may not happen for years and years and years um, to repurpose that space in between the curbs to create the complete and green streets that this legislation is trying to advance. Right. And, and um, you know, I've seen that uh, your work and the work of the planning uh, uh, commission has done this, the planning board has done this through um, sector plans where you've adopted, you've talked about the need to implement the urban street design standards and then to extend their application. Is there any way to link up this legislation to, you know, the legislation is focused on designated, you know, transit centers or metro stations, pipeline stations and, and other designated centers, including Brandywine, by the way. Um, to there's sort of kind of logical ways to extend the implementation of those urban street design standards through like a sector plan process. And is there some way we could maybe legislate that in this bill? <laughs> well, I mean, it's at some point we have to, we, we have to balance the desire to have the, the best possible facilities everywhere in the county with our, uh, you know, self-imposed caps on revenue generation that we, you know, we can only afford so much. Um, but I will say most of the complete and green streets that have been constructed since the standards were put into place in 2016 are outside of our centers. So extending extending that has often meant in the past, you know, uh, communities that have advocated strongly for those types of streets in their communities. Um, and the fact that many of our metro station areas uh, don't have a lot of people living in them who advocate for um that type of retrofit so you know there there's some opportunities certainly to expand it i know that for example uh when we we just did a, a master plan for Bowie mitchellville vicinity and uh the plan recommends uh some of the urban streets in old town Bowie, which is not a designated center but a place where for that particular community we want it, you know it lends itself <laughs> to walkability and bikeability and so it just made sense to apply the standards there so yeah through our Master and sector planning processes, uh, certainly um, where, where opportunities arise um, and where demand, um, you know, where, where, where the community demands to see those type of facilities, we'll, we'll recommend them. Um, the, the key to all of this is to be, uh, you know, honest and consistent about where our priorities lie um, so that we are getting the most bang for our buck uh, in the near term with retrofitting some of those streets that need it right away. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking over time, what, what assets can happen uh, elsewhere in the county. Well, can I ask, um, could folks maybe um, raise your hand um, and then we can um, unmute you so you can ask your question directly. I think that'd be a good way to kind of carry on this conversation. Questions? Yes. Can Stephen unmute and ask this question? He just put a a, a good, I think. A, okay, a Stephen, you're on. Hey there, uh, my name is Steve Hardig, resident of Riverdale Park. Um, and I I totally agree with all this stuff, but when I look through the legislation and the, uh, the supporting materials, the thing I am missing is um, we're, we're talking about building out things and maybe the, the quarter mile around a metro station, but how do you get, not everybody necessarily wants to ride a metro station or if you're halfway between metro stations, how do you, how do you get there? You know, there's, there's really not a lot about connecting different places. And I think the, the only way in which we can make this huge investment and make it a failure is if we fail to actually connect a place to another place. People will not use the infrastructure if they can't. People will not use this infrastructure in place of a car if they can't replace trips that they would normally make with a car. You know, they they can't commute if um, if they can't get from one town to another. Um, and I I think it's an important element that I I just don't see emphasized in uh, in the materials that I've reviewed. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's good to hear you uh, on this, uh, meet you virtually. 
Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, 100%, you, you're right that we need to make the connections. Um, and, you know, this legislation is more about, yeah, what is, when you build, how you build the street, um, you know, the, the, the street, um, you know, within that area. Um, but yes, connecting people to that, making sure people can get to and from and between centers and between metro stations is 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 key. A absolutely. Um, part of that is master plan of transportation. Um, part of that is, you know, envisioning. I mean, that's not necessarily this legislation uh, that that would be you know in this legislation, but it is something that is is critical uh, for sure. Um, and making sure that we have the bike pass, making sure that we're connecting, that a sidewalk doesn't just end, you know, I mean, you're walking on a sidewalk and boom, it, it ends, right? I mean, those are all critical things for us to address and that this council does want to address. Um, I mean, and, you know, we've, we've done that in some other ways, you know, I, there was a legislation I put in uh, a number of years ago that when a development um, comes in that, you know, they have to follow a, um, a test for automobiles to get to and from uh, that development. But there was no requirement for a certain uh, that same test to be done for pedestrians and cyclists to get to and from that development. So I helped change that. And now, um, you know, that the planning board, uh, you know, or the planning staff, when they review things, and, and Scott can tell you this, because he and I had this conversation, um, you know, anytime he reviews a development, um, he uses that to get more concessions from developers to build off site um, uh, to, to make those kind of connections. So you're 100% right. Scott, do you have a, a, a comment on that? Yeah, I was just going to echo what, what uh, Councilmember Olson said. It, you know, the connections, where these things go, where um, complete streets go, where bicycle kind of uh, infrastructure goes to, it, it's all about connecting an entire network. Um, this legislation is just one piece of that. Um, like count, the council member said, it uh, makes it clear to anyone that would construct a street in Prince George's County that isn't the state that um, you have to build to the standard and that's going to include uh, what we hope will be a, a robust and safe bicycle infrastructure. But it, you know, as far as the master plan of transportation, for example, um, the key is the connectivity. The key is for people who live in neighborhoods to safely access. You know, if you think about your, your road network and for those of you that drive where, you know, how you drive from your neighborhood streets into, you know, a more arterial road or a collector road and then to an arterial and then to, you know, a highway, uh, we have to construct the bike infrastructure that, that does that and the pedestrian infrastructure does that so that you can access uh, the destinations. And, you know, we talk about you know, this, the our, our plans are, are based around creating communities around our metro stations, our purple line stations, our mark stations. But, you know, through our master plan of transportation, we're also looking at connecting people to healthcare, connecting people to uh, healthy food options, connecting people to school. Um, you know, that's, th these are, these are extremely important things. And so we're hoping to recommend a fairly robust bicycle network um, and pedestrian network to make sure that everyone has access uh, to where they need to go uh, without necessarily needing a car. Um, and the second part of that is capital improvement program that the, the council has to pass every year. Um, you know, the, the quote is, is circulating around the Internet that a jurisdiction's priorities aren't in its policy documents, they're in its budget. And so um, it, it's important to see that these projects, not only uh, in the urban centers, but also the connectivity projects um, are happening and to work with your neighbors. I mean, we have several municipalities in this county that have attempted to uh, retrofit streets with sidewalks and have faced resistance from the community. And so those are the types of local uh, challenges that that are faced. But, you know, we can continue to uh, 
coalesce with that advocacy and 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 let people know that there are people living in Prince George's County that want to see this and want to see it now. Uh, that's how the change is going to happen on the ground. Thanks, um, Yuri. You've had your hand up for a while. Do you uh, want to ask your question? Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, I'm glad uh, Mr. Rowe brought up the kind of a technical term arterial road. Um, I don't know if we're thinking about bicycle infrastructure the same way we're thinking about car infrastructure. And I think, to be honest, I think we are because the public right of ways are where the connectivity was going to go. Like, as we know, Central Avenue Connecting Trail is having a challenge procuring land and kind of figuring out where to run with all the myriad of private properties. So usually the easiest way is to <clears throat> put something along public right of way, which means again, state highways, state those MD roads, right? Um, just thinking about myself here, I know Hamila is able to do PG on two wheels and I have an electric scooter and I go from downtown DC. And I mean, the moment I get into Prince George's County, I'm pretty much on the sidewalk along Central Avenue. But then when I wanna go get a coffee and I consider my local coffee shop as Vigilante at uh, in District 3, in council member office, also we don't have anything in G5 that I know of. I can't get there by bicycle. I got to get in the car to drive there. And then I literally park in front of the Vigilante coffee shop or behind Arrow Bicycle, take my bicycle out of my trunk and go riding for a bike, my bike there. Because again, everything in between me and that entire area and trail network are state highways. So the question is, um, as we are thinking about those arterial roads, we got to think about state highway administration that owns so many. In fact, I think Prince George's County is one of the leading counties in Maryland as far as miles of state highway roads go. And I haven't really heard SHA being brought into this conversation. And I understand we don't have legislation over it, but can we bring it into this conversation? And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. I would just say the state highway is a different front that we are on and we will continue to be on. And actually, really, I think there's a lot of opportunity with Governor Moore. He's, he's put in place... Um, some really great people in leadership roles at Maryland Department of Transportation. And I think it's really a new day there. And so we need to, it's really an opportunity to take advantage of it. But I think that the Prince George's needs to demonstrate that it can, it can design and build roads that are, um, that are safe and, and um, friendly for people who are walking and bicycling um, as much as it is to demand that the, the state does the same. Um, Ken? You had your you've had your hand up for a while. Hi, uh, good evening. I really appreciate this discussion. I'd like to expand a little bit on the topic of connectivity. Uh, one place where I see this breaking down, I see it in uh, four commercial centers within two miles of my house, is that the commercial properties don't connect up to the public infrastructure. Uh, I've witnessed uh, a man in a motorized wheelchair have to mix it up in the traffic lanes because there's no sidewalk connection into the commercial property. And the commercial owners really aren't apparently interested in making any improvements. So you could do all these great things and you could still, uh, in essence, fail at the last mile or the last 50 feet because a commercial property won't have 20 feet worth of sidewalk or uh, or pavement to have a safe access. Uh, so I think that needs to be somehow addressed with some maybe carrots or sticks. Thank you. You're 100% correct. I mean, there's so many challenges that we need to you know, overcome and, and, uh, you know, the, we've developed as a, you know, the, the commercial strip shopping centers and in, in the suburban model. And we're, that's what we're dealing with right now. And, um, uh, so that's where we are now. And that's why we, that's why it's so important for us to have these standards so that when redevelopment happens. And so when we, you know, push for, you know, better streets in these areas and we invest that they'd be done right. Rachel, yeah. Rachel Faye. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. A little bit of trouble unmuting. Um, so I, I'm completely new to a lot of the terms and the discussion that happened today. And I'm fairly new to University Park where my fiance and I uh, just moved uh, late last year. 
but you know, as somebody who has lived in cities my whole life prior to now, you know, my my default way of of commuting is through metro and public transit. The walk from our house in University Park to the Prince George's Plaza um, Heightsville Crossing Metro is terrifying. Um, just absolutely terrifying. There is, I now know it's called a slip road, um, but the crosswalk for that slip road is hidden around the corner. So cars come flying through. And even if you're in the crosswalk with the right of way, the odds that that car sees you if they're going quickly is not very high. Um, that nearly happened to me twice within the first couple of months of living there. Um, you know, even sort of looking over my shoulder as I would if I were making the turn in a car, I still, I still would have drivers coming through that slip road just at very high speeds, not thinking about a pedestrian. So one question I have is, is just, are there interim steps that the county can take moving a crosswalk so that it's more visible, cutting down, you know, some brush in some of these areas? I regularly walk up and down Route 1, and right now there's a section where there's so much brush that your choice is sort of walk on the very edge of the sidewalk or walk through the jungle. Um, and as somebody who likes to walk to and from, you know, a lot of basic needs that this community has, it feels like the one thing this community doesn't have is sort of a sensibility about just what it actually feels like to walk those, those places. So my, my question or my thought is simply that there, this is a lot of, a lot of what's been discussed today takes a long time to do and to see fully realized. And in the interim, I would love, and I think a lot of people would love to see things that they can digest and that are happening right here and now and moving a crosswalk a bit. I don't know, maybe that's harder than, than I make it sound. Um, but moving a crosswalk, clearing some brush, trying you know, to make it easier, maybe even a slow down or a sign on that street to remind people that before they get around that turn, there's a crosswalk. Whatever the it is, um, I would love to see more of those sort of the creative thinking about short-term solutions that are not high cost, but could be high yield in terms of protecting people. Thank you, Rachel. Um, number one, I wanna make sure that you have my email address. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, uh, and anytime you you know see these particular problems, I mean, we I try to make sure that I'm on top of all these things. I mean, because you're right, just having brush in the way is a is a huge problem, um, and um, I can't stay on top of all of it. Um, but I can, you know, if you let me know about those locations, you know, I can try to get someone out there to to deal with that. Um, Adelphi Road, I am, you know, trying to get more attention paid on to Adelphi Road. Um, there will be some improvements, uh, some shorter term and some much longer term or medium term. Um, but yes, the, the the walk from University Park to Prince George's Plaza Metro Station is not where it should be. Um, but you know, we're trying to improve the connections across the library, and there'll be a new community center uh, on the other side of Delphi Road, and those are priorities. Um, but let me put my email in the chat, and and um, would love to hear from you. Yeah, you know, there's lots of. Um, uh, pretty uh, inexpensive ways. Uh, in fact, DC has gone around and done a lot of um, just blocking slip lanes with a big, big, um, like a uh, uh, wheel stop or, um, or a big chunk of concrete, basically. There's, um, and, you know, cars can go up and they can take a nice sharp turn. They don't have to, they don't need that slip lane, actually. So that's one thing you can do is you could just block the slip lane and uh, make cars take a nice slow turn, nice, um, you know, right angle turn and um, and on street parking is the is, is such a straightforward way to, um, you know, you're, you have you basically you're over you have this four lane road, it really should be a two lane road. And so, uh, like, at, like on Agar Road near the Hyattsville Metro West Hyattsville Metro Station, you can just permit on street parking that Largo around the Largo Metro Station. That's a, um, a, a simple, it doesn't address all of our issues. It doesn't really get a bike facility as well, but um, it does slow down cars, which is one of the most hazardous things that we face when we're pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, yes. Uh, see, oh, Scott. I was just gonna add on, I, I was, uh, you know, encouraging news. Um, as part of the overall retrofit of Queens Chapel Road, um, the SHA eliminated the slip lanes 
uh, at the intersection of Queens Chapel Road and Chillum Road, which we were going to recommend in the West Hyattsville sector plan, and we were surprised to see it happen. And it was something they did in literally a week. Um, they just took out the supplies and they put in wider sidewalks, which is very encouraging. And um, you know, the, the echo what was said earlier. I mean, we the, those conversations with SHA are ongoing on a on a number of different fronts because we have several different priorities. And one of the things that's going to help uh, help us out is unfortunately, uh, but you know, the state sees that some of the most challenging pedestrian environments in the entire state of Maryland are in Prince George's County and in our urban centers. And so to the extent that they're prioritizing those investments, you know, some of our major uh, pedestrian safety uh, crisis areas, including East West Highway at Hyattsville Crossing, um, New Hampshire Avenue and University Boulevard in uh, in uh, at Tacoma Langley Crossroads, like these are areas where they're looking to uh, move into the next phase. Okay, well, how do we fix this and what do we need to do? And those are going to be important conversations to have with the community to make sure that it's not a, what can we do while keeping cars moving through this intersection at 45 miles an hour, but what can we do to create a truly safe environment for all? Yeah. I want to get to Thanks, Jeff Scott. and then Starlene. Yeah, and I think we're at 10 minutes too, right? So okay. should, are these going to be like the last two and then we close out? Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Kyle and Cheryl, for doing this, and thanks, um, Eric and Emmett and everyone else for presenting. So real quick, uh, the maintenance issue. Uh, right now, state has been very, very willing to help us expand bike facilities, but they won't maintain them. And until we get a guarantee from the county or <clears throat> locality, uh, they won't proceed. So if you could somehow uh, address that in county legislation to ask DPWT to be more flexible on that, uh, make promises. I don't even care if they don't do the promises just promise that we will somehow figure out the maintenance issue to get state working on it and in the meantime we'll work at the state level to to get sha to take better care of their own right away but right now sha only maintains from curb to curb and if we want to do something outside the curb on a sidewalk or a side path they won't maintain it and we can't even get the project going until we get a guarantee of maintenance i just wanted to throw that in for your consideration thanks thanks jeff Appreciate and I appreciate all your leadership um, on a whole variety of things, especially the Greenbelt East Trail. Starlene, oh, let me unmute you. Wait a minute. Okay, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to ask a question. I don't know all the jargon that's 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 associated with this, so excuse me if I don't articulate this correctly. But I am very concerned about the walkability, the safety in my community. Um, and I live right off of Locks of Vista Road near Forbes Boulevard and MLK. And quite a few accidents have happened there, as well as I'm sure you're familiar with the Vista Gardens community. But anyway, what I'm trying to find out is when are we gonna get some safer streets in our community, especially Locks of Vista Road. It was supposed to have been a speed camera placed on this road at some point. And now I don't even know what the um, what the status of that is. Um, thank you. I, I yeah, I, I wouldn't know the answer to that, but I would be happy to. I don't know if you know. I, I believe Wallable Gay would be your council member, um, and. If you put your email in the chat, I can have Walla or her, or her staff contact you. Is that, would that be fair? Yeah, Starlene, to your point, um, like I said, uh, like I said, being able to, to the council member's point, being able to, to uh, bring up these issues to your council members so that they know that these are the issues that constituents care about so that as Eric bills on the floor and other bills uh, similar to it that protect uh, pedestrians and other roadway users are um, out there that, you know, that they know that their constituents support this and, and they should get behind it as well. So um, I will love to connect with you, um, like I said, to, and, con and connect you to your council members so that you can share those concerns and um, like said, we can further advocate for the, these uh, improvements. Um, I also wanted to mention, I'm sorry, really quickly, earlier we talked about when the Transportation Infrastructure Energy Environment Committee meets on this bill. That's going to be September 14th. Um, so I just wanted everybody to know that, and that's at 10 a.m. 
on September 14th at the, at the administration building, Wayne K. Curry building. Okay. Um, well, I think that's, uh, we should about wrap it up. Um, Kyle? Um, no, this is a great discussion. I just uh, wanted to thank uh, the council member and, and everyone else that kind of have participated and shared their expertise and experiences. Um, I'm not, I know uh, one takeaway I've gotten today is that there are a lot of new people into this in this transportation space that I think it's important that we are continuing these conversations to make sure that, that folks are, are, uh, are comfortable with the language and, and know what's going on. And, and I just want to tell you that Rise Prince Short, this is a good group to connect with, to uh, get up to speed so that you can learn exactly what you need to ask for when you're reaching out to the elected leaders. But I did just want to thank the council member and mayor and Scott and, and everybody else that uh, shared their experiences this evening. Yes, thank you so much, um, council member Olson and um, Scott and mayor um, Short, um, Jordan. Um, I uh, will we'll follow up with an email and share these materials and um, want to encourage everybody again to um, to get involved and um, connect with us so that we can organize um, educating and engaging your elected officials. Um, I, I'm concerned that they mostly hear about congestion complaining about traffic congestion and the need for mm -hmm. bigger roads. So we need to get out there and really voice our concern for creating great walkable, bikeable communities that are that are safe. So um, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you to Waba. Um, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. It's always great to be on a panel with you. Um, and Dan, thank you for your leadership here as well. And, and everyone else. Go Dan. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. Uh, so with that, well, um, I'm uh, meant, I'm uh, putting in the uh, uh, our next event on um, September. Oh, it's not September twelfth. This September twelfth. Okay, it's before it's before um, the the the, the um, committee meeting. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us, and we will be following up and um, hope to uh, uh, keep everybody engaged um, so we can build um, a better Prince George's. Have a great evening. <laughs>